a Fox News alert developing at this hour. A U.S. Navy destroyer had another close encounter with an Iranian Revolutionary Guard fast attack craft in the Persian Gulf today. Two U.S. officials telling Fox News uh, the guided missile destroyer USS Mahan, it actually happened uh, Monday, altered course to avoid the Iranian warship. We're just getting details about this at this hour. They sounded a danger signal, fired flares, manned the weapons when the Iranian ship sped toward the U.S. warship with its own weapons manned. The Iranian ship closed to 1,000 yards, we're told, but did not come closer. This time, no warning shots fired. Uh, this is another close encounter in the Persian Gulf. Iran and the U.S. don't like each other. That's clear. They don't trust each other either. It is against that backdrop that negotiators from the two countries meet in Vienna to talk about their agreement over Iran's nuclear program. This is the Trump administration's first official meeting of the Iran nuclear deal and the countries that signed that agreement and the first for the United States under this administration's shift in policy. The previous administration negotiated the deal. The current administration says it represents a failed approach. The Trump administration is taking a much more holistic look based on that Iran is our adversary and is doing things to harm our interests and it's in a certain way has gotten the upper hand. It has it's in a stronger position than the U.S. and so I think you're going to see across the board increased pressure brought to bear on Iran. The State Department claims Iran continues developing its missile program and funding terrorism internationally. Officials say part of the administration's review will examine how the U.S. can confront all of Iran's behavior and potentially use the nuclear agreement to address it. The State Department says all is going to be looked at in terms of where the U.S. can apply pressure. Now, the meeting in Vienna comes one day after Politico published the results of an investigation that detailed how the previous administration, as part of the Iran deal, dropped charges against 14 Iranians suspected of arming terrorists, downplayed it, and then undermined efforts, they say, to prevent weapons proliferation. About 30 Kurds are dead, bombed in an airstrike by Turkish for forces. These are U.S.-backed forces killed by uh, Turkish Military. Both sides are supposed to be on the same side as the U.S. in the campaign against ISIS. Uh, last night, uh, Turkey's attack on U.S. backed Kurdish forces happened about 8:30 p.m. Uh, East Coast time. And uh, while Turkey did give one hour's advance notice to the United States and to Russia, it made no attempt to seek approval for the raid from its NATO allies, nor to coordinate the attacks with coalition partners. So there was no time for the U.S. to alert its Kurdish allies. At least 30 were killed and 20 wounded in the attack by 24 Turkish warplanes which struck at three different targets in northern Syria and Iraq. The closest U.S. troops were six miles away. Turkey's attack prompted a swift condemnation from here at the Pentagon where one official characterized it as very serious and in a written statement today the Pentagon noted quote these airstrikes were not approved by the counter ISIS coalition and led to the unfortunate loss of life of our partner forces in the fight against ISIS including the Kurdish Peshmerga. The State Department also conveyed its anger to the government of Turkish President Erdogan. The point we made to Turkey and I'm making now is that Turkey cannot pursue that fight at the expense of our common fight against the terrorists that threaten us all. And it was just last Monday that President Trump called President Erdogan to congratulate him on his election victory, a referendum which gave him expanded powers. He was the first Western leader to do so. His reward, the Syria fight just got more complex. That complexity is derived from the U.S. need for both Kurdish and Turkish support in the fight against ISIS. But Turkey considers some of our Kurdish allies, like the YPG, who've been highly effective ground fighters against ISIS, to be terrorists. At the same time, the U.S. can't afford to alienate Turkey, a NATO partner who allows the U.S. to use its Inserlik air base to launch airstrikes against ISIS. The U.S. also has scores of small tactical nuclear bombs positioned at Inserlik. The bottom line here, Brett, is that old adage, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, is being put to the test here as two of our allies go at it tooth and nail right now, just in advance of our attempt to retake ISIS's stronghold as de facto capital of Raqqa in Syria. This vote has angered many in Turkey. The Council of Europe says it will begin monitoring Turkey again over what it calls human rights violations and a crackdown on dissent, particularly since last year's failed coup. 
the newly adopted constitutional amendments do not comply with our fundamental and common understanding of democracy. And this situation brings new challenges. It appears that Turkey won't wait at Europe's door forever and is ready to walk away from EU accession talks if rising Islamophobia and hostility from some member states persist. Reuters reports that while speaking from the presidential palace less than two weeks after winning sweeping new powers in a referendum, President Tayyip Erdogan said a decision by a leading European human rights body to put Turkey back on a watch list was entirely political. Turkey's relations with the EU soured further ahead of the referendum, when Erdogan accused Germany and the Netherlands of acting like Nazis by banning rallies by his supporters. In and around Kabul, there is evidence of Russia's influence. Buildings that date back to the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan from 1979 until its withdrawal 10 years later. Allegations it is making a secretive return in the form of weapons for the Taliban are not welcomed by most Afghans. When the Russians start interfering in our affairs, I think our problems will double. US officials say Russia has been supplying weapons to the Taliban supposedly to fight ISIL, but instead the weapons are also allegedly being used against Afghan and NATO forces. It's an allegation Russia denies. Afghanistan's leader says his country doesn't need any more destabilizing influences. A stable Afghanistan is to everybody's benefit. An unstable Afghanistan hurts everyone. Anyone who thinks that they can differentiate between good and bad terrorism is mistaken. For many, these latest allegations confirm Afghanistan's role as a battlefield for external powers. Iran intervention, Pakistan intervention, uh, the United States presence here, they couldn't control it. The weak leadership in Afghanistan, in particular the Russian intervention in Afghanistan, make me amazingly worried about my country's situation. For its part, the Taliban has issued a statement saying the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan has not received any form of military or logistical support from Russia and that it's capable of winning on the battlefield without anyone's help. The front-runner in France's presidential election has reportedly been targeted by hackers believed to be working for Russia. A cybersecurity firm discovered that someone tried to trick members of Emmanuel Macron's campaign into sending them sensitive information. The campaign said the attempts were unsuccessful. The hackers reportedly sent out emails from accounts that looked like official ones. That's the same phishing tactic that was used to hack Hillary Clinton's campaign staff. European and American intelligence both concluded that Russia was responsible for hacking the Democratic National Committee in the run-up to the 2016 presidential election. Macron is squaring off against far-right candidate Marine Le Pen in the final round of the French election. Russian state media has praised Le Pen for anti-European Union policies. Russia's President Vladimir Putin denied responsibility for the hack and said Russia had no reason to want Macron to lose. But Le Pen met with Putin in March and said she wanted to remove EU sanctions against Russia. Good evening, friends. We start tonight with the military movements on the Korean Peninsula. The Navy's USS Michigan has arrived in Seoul, South Korea, as the Carl Vinson continues to sail towards the Sea of Japan. The Michigan is one of the largest guided missile submarines in the United States Navy. In response, North Korea has conducted a massive live fire drill with between three and 400 military artillery pieces. The artillery can reach Seoul, and the military planners believe it could devastate the South Korean capital. Meanwhile, Japanese officials have warned their citizens a North Korean missile would only take 10 minutes to strike Tokyo. And the president will invite the entire United States Senate and the House on went to the White House on Wednesday for a briefing on the situation in North Korea. 
This, as the New York Times reports, North Korea may have nuclear missile capabilities exceeding the knowledge of U.S. intelligence. So North Korea's key military anniversary came and went with no large-scale provocation to speak of, but with South Korea and the U.S. still holding their annual joint military drills until the end of the month, experts suggest early May is when tensions could hit their peak. While there were no nuclear or missile provocations on the North key military anniversary on Tuesday, the international community cannot let its guard down. We conduct a nuclear test at a time and location of our leaders choosing. Watchers see the end of April when the USS Carl Vinson Carrier Strike Group leaves the region and when the joint military drills between Seoul and Washington end as the most likely time for North Korea to conduct another provocation. Some also say early May, when there are no joint military drills, could see tensions hit their peak on the Korean peninsula. However, given how unpredictable North Korea is, it remains to be seen how Pyongyang will act, especially given China's cooling ties with the regime and the close coordination between Washington and Beijing. Base of new U.S. tariffs. A surprise announcement late Monday night that the U.S. would impose an average 20 percent tax on Canadian softwood lumber, escalating tensions between the two allies. For decades, America has lost our jobs and our factories to unfair foreign trade. Canada quickly fired back at the new American tariffs on lumber, calling the move misguided. It is unfounded, and we will vigorously fight for the interests of the Canadian softwood lumber industry, its workers, and their communities. US President Donald Trump frequently rails against trade deals he believes to be bad for the American economy, often directing his attacks at countries such as Mexico and China. When Trudeau visited the White House in February, the tone between the two leaders was conciliatory, but Trump hinted he might reevaluate their ties. We have a very outstanding trade relationship with Canada. We'll be tweaking it. We'll be doing certain things that are going to benefit both of our countries. But compare that with the tone of these comments just last week. Canada, what they've done to our dairy farm workers is a disgrace. It's a disgrace. Trump suggesting Canadian dairy could also be targeted. The dispute slamming Canada's currency, which tumbled to a 14-month low against the U.S. dollar. The U.S. asserts Canada subsidizes its lumber production by letting private lumber companies log trees on public lands, giving Canadian producers an unfair advantage. Trudeau on Tuesday saying, quote, you cannot thicken this border without hurting people on both sides of it. The U.S. move affects more than $5.6 billion in imports and comes as Canada, the U.S. and Mexico prepare to renegotiate the 23-year-old North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, which Trump has threatened to tear up. Mexico's government announced that it would fight any measures in a U.S. tax overhaul that broke international trade rules. If upcoming negotiations don't go smoothly, Mexico also threatened to review cross-border cooperation on security and migration. Mexico's foreign minister also addressed the border wall, saying that it is a hostile act and repeated that Mexico will not pay for its construction. Trump has been threatening an increase in taxes on goods imported from Mexico, but Mexico warned because these types of measures would obviously be against not just the North American Accords, but particularly the rules of the World Trade Organization, and so we would have the legal means to act against them. True to his word, United States President Donald Trump is indeed putting America first, as the White House has apparently created a foreign aid budget plan that reduces or cuts the United States financial contribution to practically every country and aid organization on Earth except for the Palestinian Authority. According to the document obtained by the Foreign Policy magazine, the proposed financial aid to the West Bank and Gaza has been increased by just under 5% from $205 million in 2017 to $215 million in 2018. As for the rest of the world, 41 countries' health funding was cut, and the Bureau for Food Security is set to lose 70% of their current funding. Funding for development assistance would be cut completely for at least 77 countries, and $1 billion would be taken from the battle against climate change. The budget needs to pass through Congress before being ratified and is likely to have a lot of opposition, even from conservative lawmakers. The decision to cut aid for all but the Palestinian Authority has not yet been explained, but the move comes just ahead of the May 3rd meeting between Donald Trump and Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas in Washington, D.C. 
Abbas and several other high-level PA officials arrived in Washington on Sunday, and it's not yet clear whether or not the budget proposal is on the list for discussion, but the officials are expected to talk about reviving the stalled Middle East peace process, something Abbas has suggested could be possible under the Trump administration. When the Berlin Wall fell in 1989 and East Germany collapsed, East Germans looked forward to living in freedom. But now some are beginning to wonder just how free the new Germany is. Last year, a married couple was convicted for creating a Facebook group that criticized the government's open-door migration policy. At the trial, the man complained that Germans cannot even express a critical opinion of refugees without getting labeled as a Nazi. Sixty others accused of writing speech critical of migrants also had their homes raided by police. In one poll, more than four in ten Germans said they did not feel safe in expressing their real opinion about the refugee crisis. Of course, today's Germany is very different from communist East Germany. But when it comes to criticism of migrants and the government's migrant policy, some former East Germans see similarities. Famous German pastor Dr. Theo Lehmann lived under persecution and surveillance for more than 40 years in East Germany. He learned after the Cold War that even his best friend had been spying on him for the East German police. He also learned that four local pastors spied on him. That meant that every word you spoke in public had to be thought through, even in your own room. Dr. Lehmann, now 82, knew what it was to be labeled and punished for his views. And he sees disturbing parallels between communist East Germany and the political correctness that rules Germany and Western Europe. It's extremely annoying that nowadays again you have to measure every word because later someone could come and criticize it. That hurts any free discussion and it's an incredible fear that is everywhere in society. Nobody dares to speak up anymore because you're always in danger when you say something that is against the mainstream. Germany has the standard political labels of left, right and center, but by American standards, most German politics and media range from left to far left. Flag-waving, patriotic, anti-immigration Germans are regularly branded in the media as fascist, racist and treated as a dangerous element. It's not the same as it was in East Germany. But they want to um, control us, and they do. Former East German Heidi Munt, known as the brave German woman because of her strong stand against Islamization, has paid a high personal price for deviating from the approved view on refugees in Germany. Leftists cover her neighborhood in leaflets, telling neighbors that they live next to a Nazi. Her husband Matthias lost his job because he too has spoken out publicly. No one is willing or daring to speak out because everyone would say you are a uh, right wing, uh, you are a Nazi, uh, you are a racist and they will bash you terribly and they will ruin your reputation. And uh, I know what about I'm speaking. It's a problem across Europe. Dr. Lehmann makes a bold assertion. We are moving towards a dictatorship. It's a dictatorship if one opinion is presented in such a way that everyone must conform to it. It's a fascist, racist or something. And he who does not conform, and immediately you are out. This is what we had for 40 years under communism. People are more afraid now than in the times of Stalinism. The German government is now trying to block so-called fake news on the internet which to some looks like the way communist countries tried to block information from the outside world. Two conservative groups are filing a lawsuit against the University of California, Berkeley. This comes after the school canceled a visit by conservative author Ann Coulter. Officials said it was for security reasons and they offered to reschedule. Violent protests broke out on campus in February when another conservative, Milo Yiannopoulos, uh, was scheduled to speak. Good morning. Well, it was, of course, here on the Berkeley campus that the free speech movement was born in the 1960s. Now, Ann Coulter is battling to be heard here after the university rescheduled a speech planned for this week. Now, Coulter is insisting she's going to come here as originally planned. Oh, yes, I'm going to be there Thursday. I'm on the Berkeley campus, college Republicans are fighting to give Coulter a platform this week. 
They filed a lawsuit Monday trying to force the university to ease restrictions they say are only placed on conservative speakers. In a statement, the university says the allegation that Ms. Coulter is being prohibited from speaking because of her conservative views is untrue. Instead, they blame outside agitators known as the Black Bloc, who rampaged across the campus in February, stopping a speech by the controversial conservative Milo Yiannopoulos and causing $100,000 in damage. The university did offer you another location at another time. What was wrong with that? Unfortunately, I wasn't available that day. Moreover, I found out later, <laughs> there are no classes that week. Criticism isn't only coming from the right, but also from staunch liberals like comedian Bill Maher. Berkeley, you know, used to be the cradle of free speech, and now it's just the cradle for f***ing babies. <laughs> and the fact that people like Bill Maher and Bernie Sanders were all coming out saying Berkeley is out of its mind. All of these things come together to show how cocooned and out of touch American universities are today. Now to a new lawsuit over a Bible class that's been given for decades at public schools in Mercer County, West Virginia. The weekly class is not funded by the schools. It is not mandatory, but almost every student attends. Now two residents with school-aged children just filed a, f a suit in federal court claiming the class violates the First Amendment of the Constitution. So let's take a look at the issues here with Greg Jarrett, Fox News anchor and attorney. How could a voluntary Bible class violate the Constitution? All right, a public school is government action, right? Okay. And the First Amendment says the government may not uh, establish religion. So the question becomes, is this school, um, are they endorsing or advocating actively a particular religion over another? The plaintiffs say yes, and the Supreme Court has said we will ban public schools from initiating or sponsoring religious activity. Now, John, that doesn't mean, you know, that a school has to be a religion-free zone. You can pray as long as you do it privately and don't force others to do it. You can teach a class on religion as long as you're teaching the history of the religion and you're not proselytizing or advocating religious doctrine. The plaintiffs here say, that's what they're doing, arguably a violation of the Constitution. This tiny caterpillar could help solve one of the world's biggest environmental problems. Meet the waxworm. This little larvae will one day become a wax moth. Waxworms are typically used for fishing bait and are well known for wreaking havoc on beehives by eating their wax combs. But as one scientist at the Institute of Biomedicine and Biotechnology of Cantabria found, they also like to eat plastic a lot. Federica Bertaccini first noticed the caterpillar's affinity for plastic while she was cleaning up a waxworm infestation in a beehive she keeps at home. She put the waxworms in a plastic bag, tied it shut, and continued to clean. But it didn't take long for the worms to chew through the plastic and escape. From there, she teamed up with researchers from the University of Cambridge to study just how well these little guys can munch away plastic. They found 100 waxworms could break down 92 milligrams of polyethylene in just 12 hours. It's pretty darn impressive. Polyethylene is a notoriously tough type of plastic to degrade. Researchers say factories produce about 88 million tons of polyethylene each year for products like plastic shopping bags. And some of those products can take up to 400 years to degrade in garbage dumps and landfills. But one of the study's authors told the BBC that Caterpillar will be the starting point. We hope to provide the technical solution for minimizing the problem of plastic waste. It's not the type of roommate most want in their home, especially the kind that doesn't pay rent. But in this case, this pigeon won't get the boot from its new nest at Genevieve Roman's New York City apartment. I'm thinking I'm gonna let her stay. The mama-to-be has made this red pasta colander which sits on a shelf in the kitchen, her home, as she cares for two eggs. Is the bird a squatter, intruder? That's the least of Genevieve's worries. She tried calling animal control for some help. They were just laughing at me. They were like, well, if this was a falcon, it would be different. Some days, the pigeon, who she named Adelaide, flies the coop through an open window. Other days, she just sits. Genevieve's never had such a wild tenant before. So for now, she'll just wing it. <laughs>